Welcome to this After Effects tutorial aimed at beginners wanting to design and animate their first Halloween projection mapping show. This video is going to be pretty long. Um, I am literally going to animate this whole show and walk you through everything I do step by step. We are going to start off fairly simple and with each scene build up the complexity towards the end. I planned this show very deliberately. Um, one, to be achievable for a beginner, I believe. And two, each scene introduces you to a new principle or technique so that by the end you will have a solid grounding to go away and build on. So I just want to talk quickly about the assets I'll be using when I'm putting together this show. So I am going to assume that you already have your facades made. Um, and by facades, I mean these base images on top of which we're going to put animations and effects. So I created these in LumaMap. Um, and I'm not going to cover how that's done because I do that in other tutorials. There is a free trial for LumaMap, although most of these facades were generated using the presets that you can only access with the paid version. But you can use custom prompts in the trial and you get 25 free trial generation. So you could use those um, using custom prompts to get some facades. For two of these scenes, in fact, I used a custom prompt. The Stranger Things, House and the Dungeon. So I'll give you my, my prompts that I used for those ones. Um, the a very important thing to say about all of the facades is to note the resolution of them, which you can see um, up here. For, for me, that's 1920 by 1080. And that is the resolution of my projector. So that's really important that I'm always working at the resolution of my projector, just to make sure that everything we do here in After Effects, all the comps we create, um, we're, well, I'm working at 1920 by 1080. Yours might be different depending on the resolution of your projector. But just to say that that's really, really important to keep tabs on that, that you're working to um, the correct resolution, um, the resolution of your projector. Aside from the facades, I am going to be using or working with free media assets that I found online um, and I will put links in the description to all the assets that I used. All my audio um, came from um, Pixabay and um, just make sure you're searching for sound effects or you know maybe music but um, I was using sound effects so I made sure that I was uh, searching for sound effects here. Um, for the videos that I am using, these were a combination of also Pixabay, where I found some nice stuff like these um, skeletons. You can just um, download them. Low resolution, I think, without an account. And then maybe for these higher ones, you do need to make an account before you can download them. Um, and then most of the other things were found on YouTube, where I'm trying to identify, you know, like free spiders. So, um, Certain channels will just be a lot of green screen footage or um, royalty free, free free videos. So just trying to identify those. And the way you download, or the way I downloaded um, YouTube videos was I just searched for YouTube downloader and I ended up using this one. So all you do is you copy the URL of the YouTube video and paste it in here. Um, on the video tab, there's quite a lot of um, spammy stuff that might pop up, but uh, video. And um, you just use these download links. Just bear in mind that even though it's offering me 1080, uh, this quality only goes up to 720. So just bear in mind, don't get excited if it says, oh, 4K footage, you know, oh, lovely, high resolution, but it can only actually deliver. It, it may well produce a video at this resolution, but the quality is only going to support the maximum that the original video had. So um, you just download that and that's how I um, got the assets that I will be using. Just a disclaimer, the copyright situation is not always clear for stuff found online. 
I've tried to only use things where it's clearly royalty free, but I want to say that I'm using them as an example and the fact that I'm using them doesn't mean I'm saying they're 100% free to use. You should do your own homework to make sure you're not violating anyone's copyright with the assets you use in your own shows. If you're not impressed with the quality that you're finding um, free online, I do actually um, sell holiday projection mapping animations in my shop, so um, you might find something that you that you like there. Okay, so let's dive into making this Halloween show. I'm looking at a, so I've just opened After Effects software and this is what I see. Um, the first thing I am going to do is um, just set up some folders just to keep my project nice and organized as I move forward. So um, the way I can make a folder is by clicking on this icon here over in the project tab. You might have effects um, highlighted. You want to be on project. If you don't see project, just make sure that it's um, checked on here under window. So I'm going to make a new folder with this icon and I'm going to call it 001 assets. So in here, I'm going to bring all my media like video, audio, um, my facades, things like that. And I'll make folders for them in those categories um, within assets. Another folder that I want at this level is 002 sub comps. Now comps, uh, comp, stands for or is short for composition and compositions are the scenes we work inside within After Effects. So we'll talk about compositions a lot and I'll probably shorten it to um, comp. I'll talk about comps. So um, each facade is going to have its own comp and then those comps go within my sort of master composition, which will be my entire show. Um, so the sub comps will go within this folder here and then um, my main show will just be kind of loose here at the root. Um, okay good so within assets I'm going to create another folder and I will call this facades and now I'm going to import my um, facades so I can do that by going to file import file and I have put them here in image, house facades, selected. These are the ones I've selected. So here they are. If I select one and then hold down shift and select the last one, so I select all of them in between and import, they'll all come in together. So here are my facades. Great. Uh, so I'm going to make um, a couple of other folders um, for my videos, for my audio, my sound effects, my music. Um, but I'll just fast forward through that just so you can see me putting my project together. Um, I'll just be repeating the same steps. I'll be creating folders like this. This will be video and um, just using import again. So now you know how to do the same thing for your project. Lovely. So now my project is nice and organized. I'm going to quickly save it so that I don't lose any work and I can um, easily save them. Save projects later, save over it later. Good. So I'm going to start with the dungeon and what I have planned for this one is I'm going to show you how to cut out areas that you don't want. So for example, I don't want to project on my roof. So I want to cut out these sections here between um, the windows and uh, maybe also cut off some of this uh, side area and some of the floor. So um, that's something you might well want to do with um, your facades as a first step. And also I am going to show you how to cut out the windows so that you can sort of put different animations uh, behind there. So I want to put some skeleton, skeletons dancing uh, animations here in the windows and in these archways and doorways. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to use masks. So that's how we define areas that we want to keep or that we want to cut out. So um, that's what we're going to do here with the dungeon facade. 
So to start doing all of that, this dungeon PNG needs to be in its own comp. So the way I do that is I click and drag it here in the project tab and I drag it onto this icon here, which will automatically put it into its own uh, comp with a timeline um, and we can see the image here inside the comp. It's inherited the name of the image, so it's already called Dungeon, which is brilliant, that's what I wanted. Um, and I'm just going to click and drag the Dungeon comp and put it into subcomps, because that's where I said I was going to work, uh, that's where, where I was going to organize my, um, my subcomps. So just kind of keeping things clean and organized as we go. So here is my Dungeon, uh, dungeon facade. And let's start going about cutting out the areas that I don't want. So to help me with that, I'm actually going to grab my original outlines. So these are the outlines I drew around my house and I use these in LumaMap to generate the dungeon facade. Um, so there's a relationship between these outlines and the dungeon, um, the dungeon image. So if I click and drag the outlines here above <clears throat> my dungeon image, I um, now have my outlines in this dungeon comp and um, what I will do is I think I will invert this. So um, what I've done is I've gone over here into um, my effects panel and if you don't see this come to window and make sure effects, effects and presets are checked on. Um, and also you should probably make sure that you're seeing the same workspace that I am. I'm in the default workspace, so yours should look like mine if you also make sure you're working in the default workspace. So effects and presets, I've just typed in invert in the search and here it is. So I can click and drag it onto my outlines and that flips black to white and white to black. And then I'm going to switch this blend mode, which, um, I won't get too much into it, but it basically, all of the different modes in here are different kind of mathematical operations that are happening to the pixels in this layer. That sounds very complicated, but we'll build on this and it'll come back. But all you need to know for now is um, set this to screen and it will get rid of all the black areas and keep the white areas. So now I can nicely see my outlines over the top of my um, dungeon facade. And now if I select my dungeon dungeon image, dungeon layer here in, um, in my comp, I can use this tool here, this pen, pen tool up in the, um, the toolbar. And again, um, make sure you're seeing, I think it's tools, yes. Okay, Windows tools will ensure that you're seeing the same thing up here. So pen tool. I am just going to start, maybe I'll start here, clicking the areas that I am interested in. So I'm just clicking with my mouse and it's dropping a little knot or a handle node um, in all the places that I click and we're kind of defining the shape that we're interested in. Um, this was a shrub, a bush. Um, I'm not going to worry about that too much. I'm just going to project over it. Um, you might want to do something else with yours, but I'm fine leaving mine. And now that I've come to the end of the shape, if I hover over my initial node, uh, you can see the circle, which is asking basically, do I want to close the shape? So if I click exactly on that node, that closes the shape and the mask closes and completes. And I've set, I've kind of defined, I'm only interested in the area within this shape. So I've cut out all that other stuff. And I can find that mask. If I swivel open uh, my dungeon layer here with this arrow, it's under masks. And here, this green mask that I've just defined, that's how I can access it. Good. So um, now I will cut out actually one thing I do want to do is on my house um, 
it's semi-detached and I have a neighbour um, over here on the left. So there actually isn't a clean div uh, divide like this one. In fact, there's like a lot of trees and bushes and stuff like that. So I actually don't want this hard line. So I'm just going to, oh, excuse me, undo. Um, I am going to just go back to my selection tool, click off the mask, but then click back onto this node that I'm interested in. And I can move all of these individually. So if, say I wasn't happy with this one, I can click it, move it, um, and change the mask. So that's how you can edit a mask you've already made. So I'm just going to grab this one and extend it out like this, and all will become clear in a moment why. And similarly over here. And I'm also going, oh, so now I'm going to draw another mask. So I'm making sure that my dungeon layer is enabled. And I'm going back to the pen tool, and this time I'm going to click something like this. So a kind of a shape that captures um, just this area that I've talked about wanting to not have a hard edge. So obviously this isn't what I want, it's including all this stuff here in the mask. But what I can do is say this pink mask 2, the second one that I made, so it um, stacks them in sort of the order that you make them. This is the oldest, this is the newest. Um, I can set this from add. So before it's saying add, basically add this to my layer. I do want it. If I set this to subtract, I'm saying subtract it from my layer. I, I don't want it. So I've now cut out all the area within that pink mask, mask two. What I can do if I swivel open mask two, here the mask feather, Feather means kind of the softness or the, the fall off. Um, if I switch the, if I drag this up a bit, I can give it a soft blended fall off. So that will just be gentler um, and just kind of gradually fade the content off towards my neighbor's house, which is what I want. So I'm happy with that. Um, the next thing I am going to do now, I am not interested in my outlines anymore. So I'm switching off their visibility. So here in this column where we have the eye, and um, this is the layer's visibility. So I'm just toggling that off. And now I am going to make sure my dungeon is still selected and I want to start cutting out some of these windows. So we're still going to use the mask tool for that or the, the pen tool in order to make a mask. But um, rather than just clicking points so that we get these straight lines between the shapes, we're actually going to make some more, slightly more complex shapes um, that involve uh, curves. So the way we do that is I'll make a click. And then if I make another click, but I don't release it and I drag it, this handle appears. It's called a Bezier handle. And um, this helps us define curves. So I'm just gonna extend this one out and then make another one here small one there and using these curves these handles I can make curved shapes and they do take a little bit of practice getting used to this kind of um, handle business but um, you will get better at it as you go so I'd recommend just practicing um, close the shape and this one because I want to cut out the window I'm going to set it to subtract We'll get rid of that. And I'm just going to do the same for all these other apertures, um, archways, windows, doorways, etc., where I want to remove the content inside and put something else um, like a skeleton animation, which is what I have planned um, in these areas. So um, I'll fast forward while I do this. Okay, great. So now I've masked out my windows, I'm going to grab the animations, the skeletons that I've planned to put in these areas, um, and they will be within video. Uh, they are, let's see, in fact, if I search for skeleton 
Um, yep, here they are. So I can hold shift, select all of those and drag them into my comp. So I'm seeing something. I'm going to turn off their audio if they have any and deal with them one at a time. So I will first deal with this one and turn off the visibility of these ones and deal with them later. So let's have a look at this guy. In fact, I can solo just this layer to look at it properly um, using this dot in the, in the column. And he's obviously way too big. So the first thing I will do is scale him down. And the way I can do that is I've got the um, selection tool enabled and you see these handles here uh, on the corners of the media. If I click and drag on it, I can scale it down, but you see it's um, squashing uh, and stretching unless I hold down shift while I do it. And that will make sure that the, um, the proportions of the footage are maintained even though I'm scaling it up and down. So this guy, I think I will have him kind of walk across the doorway like that, maybe move him down. And um, that reminds me that something I want to do is reduce the length of this whole comp. I want to um, basically say that I want this to be 20 seconds long. So the way I can do that uh, is, well, multiple ways. And the way we'll do it right now is to go to composition, composition settings. And it was important that I had my, it's important to have your dungeon composition uh, selected either here in the project window um, or you can click the tab here and see the blue highlight around uh, the the window here that means it's selected so that when I go to composition composition settings um, they are accessible and they relate to this particular composition the dungeon composition and the duration is currently um, 12,500 frames which is very long my maths is not too good to work out how much how long that is um, but we are 25 the frame rate 25 so that means 25 frames frames per second and i want this to be 20 seconds long so that means i want a duration of 500 frames you might actually see um, a time code here next to your duration depending on what your project settings are i'm uh, uh, my project settings are to be dealing with frames but you might um be dealing with time so you would just put 20 seconds in the time code that you see um, if not I want 20 seconds so 500 frames okay so my whole comp then um, comes down to be a maximum of uh, 500 frames over here on the on the timeline and also over here I can see um, 499 frames uh, so yeah 500 frame comp and now my skeleton guy is um, an appropriate length for the kind of length of animation that I have in mind. Uh, you can see I'm kind of going off um, the edge of the content here. I'm going to put a mask around him so that we only ever see him in this region and not over here. So my pen tool again, this layer with this skeleton is selected. So I just click a mask around. And now um, I'm only gonna see him within that. I won't um, catch a glimpse of him over on this right hand edge. Good, so that's that skeleton. Uh, let's take a look at this one. So he's doing a thriller dance. And I think I would like him in this um, window up here. So again, scale him down. I'll grab a different corner, doesn't matter. Just grab one of these handles. Um, it even works from, from this middle one. Holding down shift to keep the proportions and scaling him down. I'd like him to be a similar size to um, my guy here. So they are, yeah, not too bad. Maybe a little bit smaller. He fits within the window. And then again, pen tool. Let's just make sure we can only see him in this region here. Don't see his feet or 
arms as they wave about. So now he'll only be within that window. Um, maybe I will uh, just select the pen tool and make sure that he is more centered in the window. So here is the anchor point, which tells us the middle of the media. So likelihood is the animator made him in the middle. So I probably should have centered that anchor point in the window and, and um, kind of realized that this would be the center. So you can see now because I've moved my layer, the mask has moved with it and it's now not in the right place. Well, that doesn't matter. What I can do is double click on the mask get this bounding box up and then click anywhere in the bounding box and just move the mask back into place. So yeah, I think that's better. I think he's, um, sorry, my computer's a little bit slow to load. So he'll be doing his thing more within the window, which is what I want. Good. And I think I'd also like him to have a friend in this window doing the same thing. So pretty much a clone of him. Uh, and so what I can do is duplicate this layer. So with the layer selected, I go to edit, duplicate. Now we have a second copy, which we can click and drag into this window here. And interestingly, no, no, that's correct. Okay, so I just want to now adjust this mask so that he really is staying within his uh, window. Great, and I think that's good. They are in perfect synchrony, but synchronicity? Uh, they are moving at the same time because uh, the layers are at the same point in the timeline. If I kind of have a bugbear where I hate anything to be like exactly the same, um, it just sort of smacks of a, a, a duplicate, a clone, um, and dare I say a bit of laziness. So um, I will just ever so slightly drag this layer and offset it in time. Um, so that even though they're both dancing to Thriller, there's just ever such a slight delay to this guy and um, just give him a little bit of personality of his own. Like he's doing his own thing. Okay, I'm happy, happier with that. I know that's a little thing, but um, there you go. So finally, I will now look at these guys, the skeletons dancing, and they are doing some kind of skeletal ballroom dancing, which is very nice. So I'm going to scale these guys down, holding shift, of course, and kind of uh, position them. And now they take kind of a while to get going. There's quite a lot of um, nothing happening in this animation for a while. So I'm just going to, so I'm clicking and dragging on the layer and moving it forward in time so that here um, at 10 frames, which is um, if I drag my playhead around, I'm um, dragging kind of in time. Wow, okay, so they don't appear until this point, so. There we go. I'm just going to drop down to half resolution just to get these previews um, happening a little bit faster as I work. Um, so we'll see a little bit more pixelation, but that's just because we're at half resolution. Similarly, I don't feel like we're seeing enough of this guy, so I'm also going to move this forward. So 
so that much sooner we're catching a glimpse of him and he's kind of doing his funky thing. Okay, we're definitely starting to zero in on um, finishing this shot. What I would quite like to do is get these colours a little bit more matched because um, this guy's kind of pretty white, these are a bit yellow and these guys are very blue. So what I am going to do is select this group here and I'm going to, because they have a bit of um, colour in them already, I can use that colour and shift it from this blue more towards this kind of yellowy orange. So I'll do that with the hue and saturation effect. So because this layer is selected, I can actually just double click this and it automatically applies to the layer. And I can see it here um, in my effect controls panel. Uh, so you can switch between project and then here your effect controls. If you can't see them, make sure effect controls are enabled here under window. So, um, what I'm going to change is the master hue. So I'm going to be taking this blue and shifting it more towards a, so we're going through green now. Um, now we're entering a redder kind of territory. Maybe it went too far there. It's kind of orangey um, and maybe take out a little bit of that saturation. Which I think is starting to match these a little bit more. It could be better, but um, you can see the effect. If I turn, um, if I click FX here, that will just um, disable and then enable the effect of the effect. So it's on now. That was it before. So you can see that it's had a positive impact, I think. And then this guy here, he's fairly white. Um, so there isn't a lot of hue or saturation for me to um, kind of shift on this one. So instead what I'm going to use is the tint effect. And here it just uh, lets you define what you want to map black colors to or black um, values to and white values to. So white, I can click this um, eyedropper tool to go and pick a color and I'll pick this guy here. That's probably taken it a bit too far. He's now too yellow. So if I click the swatch and maybe just take it more to this kind of place, that's better. Not perfect, but anyway, a bit a bit closer. Again, if we turn it off and on, just yellowed him up a little bit um, like the others, but um, I'll leave it there for now because you probably get the idea. I am not like, definitely not liking the way that skeleton is just popping on like that. So, um, what I'm going to do is take these two um, thriller skeletons and maybe put them more towards the middle of the composition just so that they kind of are part of the meat and sort of substance of the scene. And to avoid them popping on like that, I think a gentler alternative and the best that we can do in this situation um, without having any more um, obvious way to kind of introduce them as a transition or animate them in would be through just fading them up. So what we can do is uh, control the opacity of the layer and the opacity can be accessed here if we um, just swivel open the layer and it's here under transform opacity and that's basically how um, how solid or how transparent the layer is. So it's 100% now so it's you know fully fully opaque, fully solid, fully visible. If I dial this down, turn it down, it's now 11% opacity and then all the way down, the way down to zero so that um, it's not visible at all. So if at the beginning of this layer, um, so I've just taken my playhead, I'm clicking and dragging it and I'm also holding shift, which will help me snap. Do you see how it's just kind of popping to the beginning of this layer? Um, holding down shift just helps me snap to the beginning of the layer. And what I will do, so I've set my opacity down to zero now. I'm saying at this point, be invisible essentially, have no opacity. And then this stopwatch here lets me set a keyframe. And this is a really important principle if you're gonna learn After Effects. This is kind of the mechanics of animation. 
if I click this stopwatch, it puts this keyframe here and it says, um, it sort of puts a pin in time and says at this moment, this thing is happening. So at this moment, at this time, uh, 87 frames, the opacity is zero. But if we move a bit ahead, um, a couple of frames, and then we say, make the opacity 100, can you see how, because we have this stopwatch uh, pressed down, enabled, it's automatically added another keyframe because we changed this parameter. And now we have a pin in time that says, make the opacity 100% at this point. And then between these two points, After Effects interpolates. So it will go from zero to 100. And in practice, what that means is the footage fades up. So we go from nothing and he fades in like that. And we've done that by keyframing the opacity parameter. And then similarly at the end, well, they kind of disappear off frame by themselves. Okay, so we don't need to do any extra work. I was going to propose maybe fading them out, but I don't think it's needed. Good, so we have a fade in. And we want to do the same thing to this guy. And luckily we can actually just drag a box around these keyframes. Use Control C to copy. Select this layer. And what's important is the keyframes will paste, which is what we're going to do, um, wherever the playhead is. So if we want it to be at the beginning of this layer, then we actually need to have the playhead at the beginning of, of this layer. So I'm holding down Shift and just moving it slightly. So now we're at the beginning of whoops, this layer. So I double clicked by accident. And now we're looking at just that layer. So if that ever happens to you and you think, where the heck has my uh, composition gone? You need to come back here to your composition tab. Um, that happened to me all the time when I was a beginner and it's very frustrating. Uh, so now we're back in our composition and I'm just gonna use Control V to paste. And now if I swivel open this layer, again, under transform, which is where opacity lives, we now have some keyframes because we pasted them in and that skeleton is doing the same thing. Where has he gone? Why is that happening? Interesting. His position has changed. Hasn't it? He's over there on top. How strange. I'll have to watch this back and figure out why that happened or it's a bug. How interesting. Anyway, um, we've put him back where he belongs. And isn't it fun when unexpected things happen and you're recording what you're doing? Good. So now they fade in and I think that's just a little bit more elegant than having them just pop on out of nowhere. Um, and the others, I think, are fine. This guy just kind of passes across and goes out of view. So um, that's pretty good. Collapse these down just to keep things a bit cleaner. Maybe I took it too far with them not being in sync after my big speech. Well, okay, there we go. Compromise, something like one, one frames difference. So that I get my little bit of variation, but they are still expert uh, dancers dancing in time to the imagined beat of Thriller. Okay, good. So dungeon, I'd say, is now complete. So if you want to play back your animation, so so far we've just been sort of moving the playhead to um, get some animation, but if you actually want to, you know, press play and, and have it play back properly, you can do that here under preview. If you don't see that, make sure that under window you have preview checked on. And you've just got some basic player control, so play, we'll start the playback and then stop. And then the shortcut here, you can see space bar, so space bar, we'll play and then space bar again will stop it. Um, my range is set to the work area. Yours might be set to this, but mine um, is the work area. And do you see this green bar underneath the uh, timeline? That uh, represents the frames that have been cached. So if the, the frames have been cached, it just means that playback will be in real time and um, nice and smooth because the frames are already there and uh, 
After Effects just needs to play them. But if I were to purge my cache quickly, you see how that the green bar disappears because now no, no frames have been cached, I just deleted them. So that means that when I play back, um, these green frames need to cache again. And you might find that depending on how um, sort of laborious or uh, difficult to calculate your animation is, it might kind of stall and stutter just because the frames can't cache fast enough uh, in order to play back in real time. So um, you might find that at first, while this bar is um, caching, it's a little bit stilted, but then once you have the green bar and you play back, it'll be nice and smooth and in real time. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there for this one. Um, and move on to the next one I have planned. I think if you are feeling like, oh, this is a long tutorial, I don't know if I can do the whole thing. I hope this dungeon facade, at least, has given you a primer to After Effects in and of itself. You know, we have covered quite a few principles. You've learned how to mask, you've learned how to um, use layers, you've used how, you've learned how to um, keyframe, you've uh, played with some of these properties, uh, you know where to find them. We've kind of moved things around in time. Um, so even if you were to leave it here, I hope you don't, I hope you stay for the, for the whole thing, but um, even just with this one, we could see it as kind of like a mini project that I hope would give you um, enough of a grounding to maybe go and do something else different to this, um, but like using the same uh, the same concept. So um, I hope you feel that same way too. But anyway, let's move on to another facade. Um, so I have my facades in here and the one I want to do next is um, ghosts. So this is my kind of spooky, ghostly, eerie, um, haunting facade. So I'm gonna make a comp for this one as well. And if you remember before, we just grabbed uh, the dungeon facade and we dragged it into a comp. Um, we can do that for each one of these, uh, no problem with that, but actually why not select all, um, I'll take out the dungeon, but by ho I'm holding control and just um, deselecting dungeon because we've already done it. And we can actually do um, all of them at once just to save ourselves some time and be a bit more efficient. So I'm dragging them onto the uh, comp icon and it's asking me, do I want a single composition or multiple compositions? So I want multiple. I want each facade in its own um, composition. And the other uh, advantage of this is that I can set the duration right here. So I know I want it um, 20 seconds, 25 frames per second. So just as before, that was 500 frames. Click OK, and now look, they all have their own comp that's 500 frames long. I'm just gonna grab these and drag them into my sub comps, which is where I'm storing them. And that saved us a lot of time. Cool, so now I'm gonna double click ghosts and let's um, do some animating in here. So this one's gonna be a lot quicker uh, than the skeleton one because I wanted to do quite a lot to start off with with the skeleton one in case um, people sort of drop off from this video. Um, so the next couple of ones are going to be quite quick and each one is going to focus on a certain principle that I think is going to be really useful um, for lots of different um, for lots of different things uh, like a wide ranging application uh, in what you might want to do in your own projects. So for ghosts, I am going to put some kind of spooky so um, I'm going to put some ghosts over the top essentially and I'm going to use some footage that I found online and I just need to find it. I could search for ghosts again. Nope. Okay, here it is. Um, it was ghost, not ghosts, there we are. So it's this footage of these kind of like wispy ghosts flying out and I hope they're gonna look like they're kind of emerging from the house and uh, flying around. So um, let's drag it in here above my facade this time. And here are the ghosts, but the problem is the black background is obscuring what's behind. Whereas I just want, I want the ghost to kind of be on top of my facade. So 
In fact, let's just rename this. We didn't do that in the skeletons file, but um, you should know that you can also rename these layers so that we can be a bit neater. So I might just say um, ghost animation uh, to save us having to look at that um, ugly file name. So we used blend modes briefly uh, before in the skeleton uh, facade when we were putting our outlines over the top. And we're going to do exactly the same thing here. But the principle that I want you to kind of take away is that if you have white content that you want to retain, but you have a black background that you don't want, then these lighten uh, blend modes here in, in this category are going to be your friend. So we've used screen before, let's do it again. And that's already looking pretty much like what we want. So the black has gone away and the white pixels are left behind. So the main takeaway from this is anything with white, white pixels that you want to keep, but a black background that you don't want to keep, I want your mind to start thinking, um, oh, maybe I'll test out some of these um, blend modes because they're going to be my friend in this in, in this instance. So that's the main takeaway here. And I'm not actually going to do all that much more to this, um, this facade, other than um, I think I'm going to tint these ghosts. Oh, look, I already have tint um, selected. Uh, or, you know, I've searched for it and here it is in my effects panel. What I, well, okay, so I could click and drag it onto my ghost animation, but remember if I were to have this selected, I could just double click and there it is in my effect controls. And I want to map white to, I'll use the eyedropper again. Let's pick a color from like a light color from, from the facade itself, just so that we're in the right kind of color world, um, an adjacent kind of color. And maybe I'll brighten them up so that they still uh, have have some uh, contrast with what's behind, but you know, it still has this kind of blue, grayish, um, purplish, lilac -y tint. So just to see the effect, I'll turn it on and off. I think it just ties them in a lot better. And I think I like them at this opacity, but you know, if you wanted to maybe make them even more ethereal or ghostly, um, maybe you want to take the opacity down a little bit, you know, 80 or something. Um, so that you could see a little bit of the content behind it, some of the facade. Um, I mean, maybe that looks cool, maybe 90. Yeah, okay, well, that you might could do that to taste, but I'm gonna leave this one here um, like it is and say this one's finished uh, because we learned the lesson, which was blend mode screen <clears throat> for white content with a black background. And you might have noticed that with this facade, I haven't gone through the steps of masking out just the areas I'm interested in and, you know, removing the roof and uh, some of these areas and stuff. Um, what I can do is borrow them from this one to save me having to do all that again. So I'm accessing my masks. I can uh, click one, hold shift, select that one, copy, control C for copy. And then onto my ghosts PNG facade layer, just paste those on. Um, obviously we don't want uh, these windows. So actually that wasn't um, the best idea of mine to bring those through as well. So we would just delete all but two. So that's of course um, an option and you would do that for each of the facades. <clears throat> but I am going to show you a way to do that even more efficiently. Um, so I'm not going to do this step on the facades to come and you'll see why because at the end I'm going to do something that will apply <clears throat> something wholesale to our whole show. Um, so we only have to do it once essentially. The Next facade I'm going to work on is the Inferno. And this is going to be similar to the ghosts in that we're going to use the screen blend mode. <clears throat> but the point of this, uh, well, the teaching point of this facade is going to be that it's, it's not just 
um, white, exclusively white pixels, it's any kind of bright or light pixels. So for this one, it's going to be some fire um, because we're also going to be using exploring those blend modes and specifically screen again. So here is my fire and flame video that I found, dragging it on top of the inferno. So um, some pretty cool fire. Set the blend mode again to screen and that's kind of looking like fire over the top of our facade, which is nice. Um, and we can combine this with the masking skills that we learned from the skeleton, the dungeon facade. Um, so if I were to scale this down and say, um, move it over here and mask it just to this area, I can put flame just in the doorway there, which looks pretty interesting. Maybe I'll put a little bit of a feather on that just to kind of soften it a tiny bit so it's not a hard edge to the mask. Nice, and I'll call this door fire. <clears throat> and same for the windows, so selecting it, edit, duplicate, Maybe I'll show a different part of the fire here. We'll keep that high and, and look like the fire's maybe kind of emerging from the window. I might take that feather down a little bit. I think it's a bit too much. window fire, rename that layer. And how about some more for I'm just moving that mask so that we're seeing um, sorry, a bit slow to let so we're just seeing a different part of the fire. Otherwise, uh, it would look the same as um, uh, this bit or alternatively like we again like we did with the skeletons just offset this a bit in time and similarly for this one and the fire will be a little bit different for each one okay again And, you know, I could do it for some of these as well, but um, just to finish off, I'll focus on um, this kind of large um, sort of mouth-like uh, gap in the wall. So let us duplicate this one more time. I could call this central fire, let's say. And I'm gonna delete the mask and sort of start afresh. it up maybe just a little bit. So first of all, I'm going to draw a mask, a kind of a general soft mask around it. And um, rather than use the pen tool to click out a uh, mask, I can also use this shape here, um, rectangle tool. But if I click and hold on it, I've got some other shape options and we can use these as kind of ready-made masks. Uh, if we draw them on top of a layer. So I'm going to choose the ellipse tool and then make um, maybe like this kind of shape. Maybe like that. Okay, and give that a bit of a feather. Might even access the handles and do it even more like that. Okay, so that's just kind of the general um, general shape of the fire. But what I want to do now is draw a mask that's going to really crisply define this bottom lip. 
So it really looks like it's inside this, this rim of stone or whatever the material is. So now I am going to use my pen tool again and I'm going to draw a shape that as much as possible, yeah, I'm not doing this perfect right now. In fact, I could turn the um, fire off for now, but still have it selected so that I can just see a little bit better what I'm doing. Oops, keep drawing. So it's really uh, not, not perfect. Okay, and then I can just close off the shape. So do something rough over here just to close it off around this side. Turn the visibility back on and this mask I should set to subtract. And that's exactly what I wanted. So now it looks like the fire is coming out of that gap. Good, so I think I'm done with this um, Inferno facade and I hope we've learnt um, that screen, screen blend mode can work with all sorts of light footage so um, with a, that has a black background. So imagine you had some um, smoke or something, you know, white smoke or um, later we're going to use some rain you know, so that's like light rain on a black background. So immediately I'm thinking, oh, are these are these modes? So, you know, add, it's just a little bit more punchy, um, light and screen. They do a similar thing. So have a little play with them. But um, black background with light pixels that you want to keep, these screen modes are your friend. And we've done a bit more um, masking. One thing that I haven't done up till now is talk about audio or, you know, sound effects, which I did bring into my project. So um, I fully intend to use some sound effects. In fact, I have a fire sound effect here, which I want to use in um, in this comp. So I'm just going to grab it and drag it into the comp. Um, you can see which layers have a, a sort of... Um, a sound channel to them. Um, if I wanted to not hear this sound effect, I could turn it off I could, by turning off the audio um, here in this column. These all have audio enabled, but they don't have any actual information in, uh, in their sound channel. So I may as well just turn these off just so that it's a little bit clearer to me that this layer is responsible for the, um, the audio in this comp. Um, one issue I'm seeing here is it's not long enough to complete or to um, provide sound for the entire 500 frames. So I, um, I don't know how good a loop point this will be, but let's just assume it's um, fairly subtle and, uh, and uh, it will be okay just to simply loop this audio. Um, so how the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to um, right click on it here in the uh, project tab, go to interpret footage main and here under other options it says loop one times. If I were to change this to two or you know more it extends this um, this layer, this media to loop twice so I've kind of extended its length so I can just grab this um, this edge here and extend it to the end of my comp and um, now that sound effect we can have a little listen sort of crack crackling fire sound um, will be in this comp uh, if you want to turn the volume down let's say because I intend to have some music playing on my show and I don't want any of the sound effects to be sort of too like competing too much with that so I might turn this down so here under audio audio levels it's currently on naught decibels um, this is a I think it's kind of like a gain so it's kind of plus or minus it's um it's sort of intrinsic volume in the file. I believe I'm not a like a sound expert, but um, something like minus 10 
will kind of take the edge off this and make it a little bit subtle in my experience. So I'm going to run with minus 10, but um, you can see how it blends with your sound mix and um, adjust it from, um, from here if you need to. And we didn't put any sound in our ghosts, but I do actually have a ghost voice, moany ghost sound. Let's have a little listen. Don't know how much you're picking up on that, sort of a, a moaning, wailing, not wailing, sort of a <laughs> grumbly, ghosty sound. So um, in that comes down here. And I have a similar issue where um, I don't have enough, but actually with this one, I think I'm just going to drag it more to the middle of my comp, just so that we have a bit of silence at the beginning and then the wailing kind of comes and goes. Um, and then back to back to silence again. So uh, now these two have a bit of sound and uh, now hopefully you would know how to import some sound, drag it into your comp and um, loop it and adjust the volume as well. So those are some um, good skills to take forward. So next is uh, spider webs. Let's take a look at that. Um, so for this one, I want to bring in some spiders, which I have here. Free spiders crawling. Here we go. I'm going to put it above. Um, this is some free footage I found on YouTube. It's not the best quality and as you can see it's not even 1920 by 1080. It is uh, 1280 by 720. So it's under resolution. Um, you might want to find and use something better. Um, quick plug for Lumabox. I do have some higher resolution spiders. But anyway, this was free and I'm going to use this for now. So I'm just going to scale it up and not worry too much about the uh, lack of quality. So building on what we learned from the ghosts, um, again, we're going to be looking at blend modes for this. But unlike the ghosts, which were white ghosts with a black background, we now have black spiders on a white background. So how are we going to get rid of the white? Well, Whereas before we were kind of in this category here, now we want to be in this category that sort of darken, multiply. The, these are going to, on the whole, um, get rid of white and retain black. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is generalizing so hugely and um, there's a lot more to blend modes, but um, rules of thumb we're talking here for beginners. So um, multiply is going to keep the dark black areas and the white background has now gone, um, which is cool. Uh, it's had a big effect and it's, the spiders are kind of crawling over the front of our house, but I'm feeling like with this glow and stuff, it's not actually feeling to me like these spiders are really on the house. Like it actually just, I don't know, it just looks a bit naff. Um, I'm not, I'm not believing that these spiders are actually on the house. So my little workaround or my kind of, I'm, I'm going to pivot a bit. And instead of have the spiders on the outside, I'm going to make it seem like the spiders are on the inside. And hopefully by now you would have a pretty good insight into how I'm going to do that. I'm going to use our trusty friend, the, um, the mask again, and I'm just going to mask out just the window areas um, and fast forward through that and you'll join me once I have completed those masks. Okay, so now just the windows are masked and it looks like the spiders are on the inside, which I think is cool. I might just turn the opacity down ever so slightly um, and also tint these chaps um, so that black whereas we were mapping white before now we're interested in black and map it to um, let's start with this kind of color yeah yeah, that brings them into the world, I think. And that looks pretty cool. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I also have some 
um, a sound effect, which is bug scuttling. Bring it down here and do the old looping trick. Let's do it three times now. Yes, that was long enough. And turn it down minus 10. So I'm happy with that. And hopefully now you'll remember multiply when you have a white background and black things that you want to keep is a good first port of call to see if that gives you what you need. Let's watch the whole thing through or we'll preview it. Not really hearing that audio all that much, so maybe we'll go back to zero. And also I think I will duplicate it and offset it a bit so that we have more of a layered, it sounds like there are more bugs scuttling around. Let's listen. Good, I'm happy with that. I'm going to save my project. And maybe just for tidiness, spiders. There we go. I consider this one complete. And now I'm going to move on to pumpkin. So with this one, my plan is to... Um, so I have some footage of... Where is it? Oh, that's my sound effects. That's why I can't see it. Um, this pumpkin face. So I would quite like to put a pumpkin face on this pumpkin. And I was lucky enough with this facade for there to have been a pumpkin generated into it, which I can use. But let's assume you have a facade or an image that doesn't have a pumpkin. Um, I'm going to walk through the steps of... Um, how you would put one in here. Um, so I just searched, I like to use Pixabay, it's a good source of um, like royalty free images. So I um, downloaded that. I think I had to make, I have an account and you, to get anything higher resolution than this, you need to make an account and download. But this one, I think you can just click download and get, and get it at this resolution. Um, but obviously this image has a, a background to it. So what I did was just search for um, a free background remover. And there are a couple here. I found this one I needed to make an account to get a high resolution one uh, to get to download the full resolution uh, version of the image. But um, which one? This one, pixel cut. It nicely cut out the background and I was able to um, download, just ignore that, um, the 1920 by 1080 full res. Uh, I could just download it without making an account, so um, that was nice. So uh, I am going to make a new folder and call it images. And I'm going to bring in that pumpkin. Here it is, so that was the original, and then this is the one with the background removed. So here it is, drag it into my comp, and I'll call it pumpkin. Just grabbing the corner, scaling it down. Maybe I'll put it there, or a little bit larger. So it's looking uh, quite a lot brighter than the pumpkin I already have in my scene. So I am going to search for brightness and contrast and just take that brightness down a bit. And now it's looking a little bit um, sort of dull and muted. So I want to put a bit more um, saturation into it using the hue and saturation effect and just increase that saturation just to kind of make them feel part of the same family. Okay, and so where did my um, free pumpkin projection? Okay, so in it comes into my comp. 
and I can use a circular mask just to deal with, just to kind of cut off, trim some of that um, excess and uh, now I'm just dealing with this kind of sm smaller masked bit. Um, I'm going to scale it down and it, so if I, um, if I don't hold shift, um, kind of like I demonstrated with the skeletons, it won't constrain those proportions because actually stre stretching and squashing is what I want to do right now. I actually want to widen it out a little bit like this, uh, give it more width than it has height, uh, just to kind of emulate the um, more oval shape that the oh, it's like squashed oval that the, the pumpkin has. So I'm happy with that. And then my mode to screen, that's looking pretty fun. And so that's a pumpkin face, pumpkin face. And I will duplicate this over here, scale it up for my larger pumpkin. And since you know I don't like things to be in sync, <laughs> I am going to quite substantially drag this um, in the timeline so that completely different sort of part of the animation is showing at any one point. So there's a nice amount of variation between these two. Um, they might even be talking to one another. Unfortunately, again, even though we have the audio channel here, I don't think there's any information in there. There's no audio track um, on this on this file, so uh, that's a shame. Um, there are some pumpkin face animations that you can buy. Um, they're very well produced, and they, um, you know, sing or talk or whatever. So, if you had an audio channel on those, you would absolutely want to want to keep them, and um, that would be sort of you know totally part of the part of the animation. But for mine, I'll just um, turn those off. And something else which I found that I thought would be nice for this scene is um, this falling these falling leaves. Um, and for the first time, we're seeing some green screen, which you might have come across before. And um, right now, we'll cover how to remove this green screen so that all we see are the leaves and then um, transparency everywhere else. So I will call these leaves. And so to remove this green screen, I am going to use the key light effect, this one. So it's on my layer. And what I want to do is here for screen color, I want to click on this eyedropper tool and pick this green color. So you're saying the, the screen is this color and, and essentially it takes for granted that you want to remove that screen. So um, the green disappears. Um, we are being left with kind of an ugly fringe around everything. So what I will do about that is I will go, I will open up screen mat and here it says clip black. I'm just going to drag that value up and you can see if I go back and forward, it's kind of like eating more and more into, um, into the, the shapes that we're keeping. So that's maybe a little bit far. So just until that fringe disappears, that's pretty good. Or a little bit more. Anyway, so you can you can adjust this. And um, this is a very sophisticated uh, effect. And there's a lot to learn here. This is just the absolute basics of it. Um, but for your average, um, your average green screen, if it's just a kind of chroma green background like this, uh, just pretty much in one click with uh, just picking the eyedropper, picking that green um, will make the green disappear. And now we have our leaves falling. So this is more of a family friendly, gentle, um, autumny scene, which is quite sweet. Um, one thing I would like to do that we haven't yet covered is add a drop shadow to these falling leaves so that it really gives the impression that we're in 3D space and these leaves are falling in front of the house and that the house is kind of set back from the leaves and a, a, a drop shadow really helps sell that illusion. So the way we add a drop shadow is by uh, selecting our leaves layer in our comp and right clicking, going to layer styles and choosing drop shadow. So we can see it 
having appeared. Um, and so here underneath the layer, if I swivel it open, here we'll see layer style. So you swivel that open as well and drop shadow, open up its parameters. And the things I want to adjust, first of all, is the distance. So let's zoom out a little bit. Um, it's currently at five, but if I increase this, can you see how it gives the impression that the, the more I increase the distance, the, the further in front of the house it seems like the leaves are. So I want them to feel quite a, like a fair distance in front of the house. So um, I'm pretty happy with that distance. Um, that's good for me. This angle is, um, it kind of adjusts, well, the angle, but it kind of changes where the the location of the implied light source is. So if the angle is um, over here, it implies that there's a light source somewhere off to the right. Um, so adjusting that, uh, can I'm happy with that. I, I certainly want it to be... Um, above uh, so that the shadow is like like there's a light source lower down I don't know why that just for somehow feels right to me for this um, for this circumstance although the light would probably be in the sky so actually I should question that instinct because I think it might be wrong um, okay good and definitely definitely take the opacity down I want this to be a really subtle effect I kind of barely want the the audience to notice it at all. It's just kind of very subtly selling an illusion. Um, I have found it in my experience that a little bit more opacity then maybe looks good in the software. You know, here in the preview, maybe that looks a bit much, but actually in the show, it's quite impactful. Um, so even if realism wants it to be really subtle, like here, maybe for a projection show, where it's all about like spectacle and just really kind of like impressing people with the illusion, just tending on the side of a little bit more opacity than you think looks good can sometimes pay off. That's just something um, to remember, but I'll, I'll leave it like that for now. Um, yeah, I'm happy enough with that. Um, something like the size, we might want to adjust that. So increasing the size makes it a lot more blurry and softer. So it's kind of like there's a lot of diffuse bouncing light around rather than like a spotlight, which casts really harsh shadows from a directional light. Um, I think so definitely not crisp like that. Um, sunlight would never make a shadow that crisp. So something maybe in that in that territory, 12 uh, could be all right, but definitely um, play with all these and um, set them to your taste but I think that's added like a layer of 3D-ness um, and kind of 3D realism that um, I enjoy in this scene. So then the final step would be adding a little bit of sound because I have some rustly, um, rustling leaves here. Drag them in, drag it in. And I will extend it. Let me see how loud that is. Hmm, that actually sounds awful. not convinced by that maybe minus 15 so it's kind of barely heard I'm not sure uh, jury's out on that one let's see how it um, feels in the the final show maybe I'll turn it down or, or turn it off or whatever but um, okay so we have pumpkin faces which were applied using screen and um, we learned how to remove a green screen so that these falling leaves uh, could show the facade underneath and then we added a drop shadow and um, talked about how that can add a kind of 3D illusion to things and I use it all the time I think it's a really quick powerful um, technique for projection shows which is all about kind of taking something 2D and pretending that it's 3D that's what I think the best project projection shows do so um, definitely keep that one in your back pocket good so now moving on to the abandoned, yeah. 
Okay, so my plan for this one is to get um, some green screen footage of um, a witch and have her move from the right of the frame to the left of the frame and then be followed by a spotlight, which is just kind of illuminating her and just a pool of light behind her casting a shadow. And then the rest is all going to be very dark because this is, I mean, it is an abandoned house, so it's a bit uh, bleak, but it's also kind of sunny and cheerful and it's not giving me Halloween. So um, we'll do something about that. In fact, maybe I'll start that process now. So I've selected my layer and I am going to add our good friend Hue and Saturation again, our good friend Hue, and just turn this saturation down so it's just a little bit more morose and uh, grim. Okay, so we've taken a little bit of that cheerfulness out. We will deal with the light, how bright and light it feels in a moment because it's linked to the spotlight. So the next thing I will do is find my witch, uh, evil witch, black smoke. Yep, here she is. And um, there's a couple of, so they've given a green screen, they've given a blue screen and um, a white background. And whereas with the other effects we've been using, we've just been dragging our footage like, straight into the comp. What I'm gonna do with this one is put her in her own sub comp, her own comp, and then we're gonna put that comp into the abandoned. Um, so we're gonna have a comp in here. That, that's what's powerful about comps is that you can nest them and do something in one comp and then it populates through into all the instances of that comp as it may feature in, in in other comps, I'm saying comp a lot. Okay, so um, here is my witch. I'm gonna drag her into a new composition and she can just be evil witch, poor woman. And now I'm just gonna scrub to the bits that I'm interested in. So I definitely wanna cut off this business at the beginning. So she starts at about here. So I'm gonna grab the end of the footage and I'm holding down shift again so that I can snap nicely to my playhead. And now I'm going to find the end of the green screen. So that's about there. And grab the end here, snap it to there. And I'm actually not interested now in these kind of empty bits of, um, of the comp. So what I can actually do is take this bar, which represents the, it's called the work area. Um, yeah, it's called the work area. And so I can hold down shift and drag that and snap it to the beginning of my footage and similarly grab this end. Whoops. Okay, so I accidentally used this and I dragged the whole thing. So um, make sure you're only grabbing the end handle. So be a bit more careful that that's the way the icon looks when I've got the end. Hold down shift, snap it to there. And now if I right click on the work area, I can say trim comp to work area. And now only that stuff that was of interest to me is in this comp. And I may as well remove the green screen in this comp as well. So like we did with the leaves, let's find key light. Use the eyedropper to say, this is the color of my screen. Bye bye screen. And I think we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of, if I just show the screen mat, it's keeping quite a lot of this smoke, um, but it's looking quite sort of pixelated and messy. Um, so what I will do is again with my uh, screen mat, clip that black so that it starts to choke. That's a technical term. Um, just kind of cut down on some of that uh, smoke. There we go. That's better. Are we still getting any smoke at all? Yes, a little bit. There's still some smoke, which is good. So back in my abandoned comp, I can now grab my evil witch. In fact, I will put her in my sub comps. Um, maybe in fact, I will put these in their own folder now and call them facades. So these are the facade sub comps and then these will be any other working comps that we that we have. Um, abandoned, 
bring in my evil witch, put her on top. And there she is. Um, she is not the best quality. And I'm not enjoying how kind of cartoony she is. So what I want to do about that is add a levels effect and just kind of darken it a lot by clicking on this um, this knot here and dragging it down, kind of taking out a lot of that detail. So even though she is still cartoony, maybe you might believe that she was a shadow or something like that. I think we can sell it like that. So um, that's fine. Now I'm going to scale her down a bit so that she's just occupying sort of the middle section of the house and she isn't too large um, in the realms of the size of a human, I suppose, if that's a door. Quite, well, she's larger than that. But anyway, um, I'm happy with that scale. And so now as for the having her move from right to left, what we're going to do now is some keyframing. So we have done a bit of keyframing before. We keyframed the opacity parameter, but now we are going to keyframe instead the position of this layer. So we're going to set a keyframe over here and set a keyframe over here, and then she's going to move between the two. So the way we do that is move the playhead to the start. And actually that, that illustrates the point that I shouldn't forget that there, there is some, she already has some animation. Uh, on her. So um, I should just bear that in mind that I'll sort of be um, doubling down on any movement or sort of fighting against any animation that's already in, in this when I add my animations. Anyway, so we're at frame zero. I'm going to add a, I'm going to uh, click the stopwatch for the positions um, to keyframe the position. And then I'm gonna, just going to click on this, this layer and move her all the way over to the right. So now we have a keyframe with her over there. And I'm gonna to go to the end of my composition. Well, okay, so to the, she, she actually um, is a little bit shorter than 500 frames, but that's okay. Uh, she can just leave slightly early. Um, and let's move her all the way over to the left. So now she moves between the two and travels across the house like that. Now I'm going to create a spotlight to follow her. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go up to this. Um, so usually it looks like this rectangle tool, but because we uh, we clicked and held it, we had um, brought up the ellipse tool. Whereas before we've used this for creating a mask, because that's what happens if you have a layer selected and you use this tool, it creates a shape as a mask. But if you don't have a layer selected when you use it, it actually creates its own shape. So this is a new shape. It's appeared here as its own layer. So it hasn't made a mask, it's made a new shape. I'll put this shape below the witch and I'll call it spotlight and with the spotlight selected, I am going to add a blur. I'm going to use a fast box blur. So it's kind of like the fall off from a, a spotlight. Cool. So um, obviously I want the spotlight to move with her, but she's been keyframed. Um, to be moving across the house. So I need to get that to match her and follow her. Now, if the original animation didn't have some baked in uh, animation of its own, what I would have done is um, I would have um, made the spotlight a child of the witch. Um, another way of saying that is I would have made the witch a parent to the spotlight. And the parent-child relationship is um, 
kind of like how a child follows its parents around everywhere. It just means that you can um, introduce a relationship where a layer follows another layer and it inherits um, properties from its parent layer. So if we'd made the spotlight a child, and we can do it here where it says parent and link, if I take this, it's called a pick whip. If I take this and and put it onto the witch, that would have meant that you can see here now the witch is a parent of this layer. And it would mean the spotlight would follow the witch around, which would have been perfect. But look, she drifts off the spotlight because she is herself animating within her subcom. She, she has transformation, like positional transformation of her own. So sadly, that's not going to work so elegantly in this instance. So what I'm going to do is just be a bit more manual about it and just kind of follow the same process that we did with the witch originally. So I'm going to swivel it open, access its transform properties. I'm interested in position. So I want to keyframe it and I'll move it over here where I know the witch is roughly speaking. She's kind of there at that point. And then here at the end of her layer, I know that she's gone over there. So it should be that it roughly follows her. I think she's also drifting a bit. So um, what I will do is just add an intermediary keyframe maybe, um, or a couple, just to check that at various points it's still on her. So just some little kind of nudge, nudging keyframes just to kind of keep it on track throughout its journey. It's not absolutely perfect, but I think it's good enough for now. So good, we have a spotlight following our spooky witch. And um, I said I was going to return to the issue of making this a lot darker. So what I'm going to do is introduce something called an adjustment layer. Uh, so I can create it by going to layer, new adjustment layer. And this acts just like a layer and it sits inside our project, but we can put effects on this adjustment layer. It's kind of like an empty container layer. Well, it's not empty. Um, it's just a kind of, um, it doesn't have pixel content, but we can put effects on this layer and they will apply down the stack. So if I were to say, put a levels on here and pull down these levels so that it gets dark. Maybe um, just increase the contrast a little bit. It's not applying to the spotlight, right? If I were to move it up, the spotlight would darken, but it only applies downwards. In fact, I'll call it darken. Um, it's only affecting our abandoned uh, facade, which is good. This is what we want. But what I would really like is for the spotlight to feel like it's illuminating the house um, underneath. So rather than just see white, I want to see a bright version of the abandoned house. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a mat on the darkened layer. Um, so let's talk about mats because they are very important, very useful, very powerful, but um, a little bit tricky to explain. So right now, the darkened layer is applying everywhere. But what you can do is you can apply a mat and say, look to this other layer to tell me, darken, where I should apply and where I shouldn't apply. So it's kind of like using another layer to drive the opacity of the darkened layer. So what I'm going to, going to do is um, set the track mat, mat for darken using the pick whip to the spotlight. And right now, what that means is, if I turn it back on, you can see what's happening, right? If I, so here's the spotlight, but if I turn it off, 
Darken is saying, okay, I'm only going to show, I'm only going to um, have an effect, a darken effect, where there were pixels on the spotlight. But what I want actually to happen is the inverse of that. And the way I can invert it is um, using this, checking this here. So now the inverse has happened. So everywhere where there were pixels on the spotlight, it's um, not showing up. And where there were no pixels on the spotlight, it is showing up. It's having a darkening effect. Um, so that's the relationship now of the matte and how it's looking to the spotlight to tell it where to be transparent and where not to be transparent. So the effect of that now is that everywhere that there uh, where, where the spotlight had pixels is now bright because it's not being darkened <laughs> and um, and everywhere else is being darkened. So I can turn my witch back on and we can see how that's kind of working. I think the darken needs to be more to really make that feel like a spotlight. And I think the witch, I'm still not enjoying how cartoony she is. I think maybe we could also give her a blur to, um, or should we? No, okay, I think instead we should give her a drop shadow. That's for sure. So I'm going to increase the distance because I want her to feel like she's, a f you know, away from the house. She's not like right up with her shoulder against the, uh, against the wall. And I think this spotlight would probably more likely be on the floor or, you know, lower down. So I'm going to change the angle so that the, um, hello. So that um, the uh, it's like there's a the light is shining up and casting a shadow above her. I'll increase the size a little bit and turn it down so that it doesn't steal too much of that nice contrast that her black body is making with the light areas of the wall. We might have lost a bit too much of that smoke, so I am just going to um, turn that screen, that clip black down a little bit. Yeah, I think I think we're getting some more of that smoke. I definitely do not want that sound that came in with the animation. Instead, I have a banshee scream. Let's hear that. Oh, that's scary. Um, so maybe she could do that twice. There and once there, but not too loud. Minus ten and minus ten. Nice. So I think I'm happy to leave it there for the abandoned facade. Brilliant, so moving on, now I'm going to do the asylum. So my plan for this one is to cut out the windows and put some kind of like zombies pushing against the window 
animations in here. Um, and then I'm also going to add some rain and some lightning. So that'll be um, quite exciting. So to start off with, we know how to remove the windows. That's another job for our trusty mask. So I've got me some gaps and now I'm going to find my, I think it's zombie invasion live wallpaper free. And it comes and let's scale it down some so that the people look a little bit more inappropriate size. I think that's a little bit oversized for true to life, but um, that's okay. We can't afford to go any smaller, otherwise they'll um, get, we'll see the edge of um, in the window. So there they are. And then just a whole lot of duplication. And if you're bored of going to edit each time, the shortcut is Control D to duplicate. So I might do that from now on. Okay. And then so that we're not seeing the exact same animation for all of them, I'm going to offset them. And in fact, if you're finding it hard to keep track on where you've moved it and you know it goes off the edge of the um, timeline what you could do is select all the ones you're going to move if you hit asterisk on your keyboard it puts a marker on the layer so now if I you know move this forward in fact add one to this as well so I'm going to move this one forward and you can just keep track of how you're staggering whoops um, a little bit more easily. So now they're all offset by a couple of seconds, just under two seconds. And that looks fun. Um, I'd say that these animations have a kind of um, coolness to them, so I want to adjust my um, asylum colors just to kind of cool them off a bit because these lights are casting the kind of like quite a, an oddly sickly warm light so um, let's get hue and pull this more into a bluer territory yeah more kind of hospitally that's a bit better, maybe less saturation. Creepier, that's better. Okay, and then I said I was going to add some rain, so I have found some footage of some rain and like we did with the witch I want to put this in its own comp so that we can cut out some of that stuff that we're not interested in like these this text and what have you so the rain on its own starts from here and runs it's got a black frame at the end. Okay, like that. So I'm going to adjust my work area. And again, trim, trim comp to work area as before. And now we just got the good stuff. So back in the asylum, if I pull the rain in like this, it's... Oh, 500 frames. Nice. 
and our old friend screen. That's a nice rain. Um, maybe a little bit less opacity, 70. 50. Yes. Now for some lightning, we are going to use an effect for this and it's going to involve a bit of keyframing and a bit of, um, you know, tweaking some effect settings. So the first step is to create a, we haven't created one of these before, we're going to create a solid. So we go to layer, new, solid. And what that does is put, so I'll call it lightning, just puts a, a solid, a, a layer of solid color in as a layer, and it's the same uh, resolution as your comp. So onto this um, solid, I am going to put the advanced lightning effect. So this is what we start off with. Um, lots of things I don't like about it already. I don't like this blue color, so I am going to change that to white, maybe with still a little bit of blue maybe, but in this more like turquoise blue maybe. And I don't like how glowy it is in general. So the glow opacity, I think I want to bring like right down. Maybe the radius is okay to be high, but just take out that, some of that glow. Um, the core settings, the core radius, I think I want to make it a little bit chunkier. So I'm going to increase the core size like that. You can also um, change other things like the amount of forking. If you increase that, it becomes like very branched. Um, I think I like the way it started off. So the main thing I think with this effect is to uh, get familiar with the origin and direct and direction points. So this is the origin. If you grab this um, red kind of um, handle here, that's the origin and down here is the direction. And the lightning won't do this kind of nice um, jittering, you know, like electrical movement. Uh, it'll just be static if we leave it like this. It's only when we animate these properties that we get this kind of like nice jittering um, turbulence. So um, that's one thing we will be animating. Um, the other thing is that I want it to be a lightning strike. So I don't want it to be starting from touching the, letting you know it's touching the ground. It needs to come from the sky, from the sky, strike the ground and then recede again back to the top. So what we can do to control that is use the decay. So it's kind of asking, well, how quickly does this fork, how does this um, like lightning strike how quickly does it decay? Like, does it reach the ground or does it decay further up the, further up the thing? So um, if we said it's decay very high, okay. So an important thing to check is decay the main core. Cause right now I'm, I'm changing this, but the, the main core of the lightning is not being affected. So definitely decay main core needs to turn on. And we want the decay to be very high. We want it decay to decay very quickly, like its rate of decay is high, so it's not reaching the ground because it has, like, it's decayed at an earlier time. So if this is really, really high, um, this is really high, we'll barely see the lightning at all because it's, it's decaying too fast. So I'm gonna keyframe the like high decay value. And then within about two seconds, I'm going to bring the decay right down because I don't want it to decay. I want it to, um, that's too, zero is too much, but what, what's the kind of ideal 
maybe something like 12. I don't like how forking it is, so I'm going to turn that right down. I prefer a not so forking lightning. Maybe increase the core a bit, thicken up the whole thing, yes. Um, okay, so I have keyframed it and I can see these keyframes if I swivel open the um, the layer, go to effects, My here's my advanced lightning and here we've keyframed the decay and here are my, um, my keyframes. So let's say I want it to strike for two seconds, so at 100 frames, um, I still want it to be decaying or well, hardly decaying at all. So I can actually just copy this keyframe and paste it here. And then two, two seconds on from that, I want it to be back to a very high decay rate. So it goes back to pretty much being in the sky. So if we go back to the beginning, it's decaying so fast that it, we don't see it. And then it reaches the ground strikes for two seconds and then recedes again and the problem with this that you probably appreciate is that you know it's just static that's not how lightning behaves and so it's like I said we need to animate these to get that that jitter going essentially so if we go to the beginning of our animation and add a keyframe here at the origin and the direction and then by the end of the strike which is here back when the decay has gone um is very high again. Um, if we say um, it's moved to here in that time and the direction has moved to there. Now can you see between those two keyframes the origin and the direction are moving and because of that movement we're getting that lovely like turbulence, it's like turbulent, turbulence uh, and it looks like a like a, a an energetic lightning lightning strike. Maybe a little bit more glow. Glow opacity too much. It's a bit more powerful. Okay. So we have a lightning strike. Um, good, but with a lightning strike usually comes a flash of light and I think that would really sell this effect as well. So I'm going to go to layer, new adjustment layer again, and I'm going to call this flash and onto this adjustment layer I'm going to put an exposure effect. And so that I can have a reference for where our keyframes are for the lightning, I'm going to use the shortcut U. And what that does is just show us the keyframes, just the keyframes that um, are applied to this uh, layer without having to swivel open all of those properties. And sometimes you kind of have so much space, it's hard to kind of um, see everything all at once. So this is just a nice condensed view, but that also shows you the keyframes so that we can see that. At this point, where there's no lightning, exposure is fine to be, because what we're going to do is up this exposure value to something really bright. Um, and we're going to keyframe that, but at this point, it's uh, it's zero. Show that keyframe now on, on here on exposure. And then at this point, our lightning is striking, so let's crank up the exposure to something quite bright, that's good. And then by here it would still be bright, so let's copy this keyframe. But by here the lightning has died, so let's copy back down to zero. And that's nothing, so it's striking and it's very bright, it recedes, so does the light. But what would be really nice is if this were kind of flashing um, to really feel like it's light coming off of this very like jittery flashing um, fork of lightning. So what we can do is add some more keyframes of this 
um, exposure value sort of bouncing around. So we could put it to, let's say, zero here and then move a couple of frames onwards and let's put it to like two. Maybe onwards, we're back to zero. But by this point, maybe we're up at three. And back to zero. So in that time, it's just really flashing around two, three, zero, flashing back and forth. And rather than continue that manual process, we can copy those keyframes and just paste, paste, paste. Could get away with three more. Yes. So now plenty of flashing to accompany our lightning. I will just trim down these um, layers because there's no lightning occurring after this point. So there's no point in keeping all this um, unnecessary layer. And similarly for the flash. And these kind of belong together. So I could give them their own color by clicking on this um, layer swatch here. Let's give them like blue lightning, green lightning. Um, okay. And also I can have multiple flashes. I don't just want one. It would be nice to maybe, I think there's space for three. So um, I'm going to duplicate. So control D. Just going to click and drag them so they stay together in my, in my comp. Um, one after the other and then move those along and again control D to duplicate click and drag so they're together move them along like that um, and I think it would be nice to add a bit of variation because these will all be identical because the keyframes are all identical they're all coming from the same origin to the same direction so to add some variation what I can do is I'm holding down shift so that my playhead um, snaps to these keyframes. And so now any parameter I change is going to automatically um, override these keyframes and, and replace these keyframes. But it's important that the playhead is exactly where these keyframes are. Otherwise, you, you know, if you're accidentally one keyframe here, even though you thought you were on top of the other one and then you change the origin you know you're going to add one there and, and you're going to get some odd behavior where it where it jumps so just keep an eye on where your playhead is when you're changing parameters that are keyframed that's very important so with this one um, the effect itself needs to be selected so you bring up the direction the origin um, points so for this one let's say it starts um, here maybe here and the origin is maybe like here. And then if we move, can move to the right. And so can this one. So now we have a, diff a totally different kind of strike. Actually, I think it would be nice if this one sort of crosses over itself. So maybe it goes there. And yeah, it goes to there. Yeah, so the origin and the direction are um, moving counter to one another. Nice. And the same for this one. Let's say it starts there strikes there, it moves to, where was it going from? To that. Great. And with lightning, 
as we all know, you tend to get thunder, so let's not neglect the sound um, component of um, this this uh, sequence. So I have some thunder, and I will put it here. And I would like it to be tailing off. So I can keyframe the audio level and then by here it's not audible. That's a bit more gentle, less of a um, a steep uh, decrease in the audio level. So I could make that uh, cyan as well, just to remind us that it belongs with um, the lightning and the flashing. Duplicate. With that one. Duplicate with this one. Now, you might have heard that I think the zombies have their own sound. But that's becoming quite a mushy sound because we have so many of the same um, like bits of media so I think only keeping the audio on one of those would be a good idea. That's not too bad. I think I'll leave it like that for now. I don't like these white um, beginnings to the zombie animation, so I think I'll just bring them all forward so that we start with figures in the window. I think that would be nice. I've realized that the, the crash of the thunder is probably occurring too early because it happens after lightning strikes, I believe. So it's happening around here. So I think it would be a good idea for it to happen at least part way into the strike. So if I were to offset all of these like that, Yeah, I think that's a lot better. Great, so now moving on to our final, my final uh, facade is this uh, Stranger Things inspired, inspired uh, facade. And um, I generated this in Luma Map using a custom prompt. Um, so you can see the prompt I used there if you wanted to um, emulate it as well. Um, so. I have found some fantastic green screen footage. What a legend 
who put this online. It's so such high quality. Um, I'm confident that it is copyright free. It's on like a green screen channel, um, like royalty free. But like this is brilliant. Thank you, whoever did this. Uh, and so because we're seeing a green screen, we know what we want to do to this to remove it. We make our own uh, a new comp just for the demo or gone. I believe that is what it's called. So Demogorgon and the section that I am interested in is this one because he kind of jumps around and they're sort of short sequences so I don't know how useful some of the other bits would be. Maybe you could have like spotlights that come up and show him briefly and then the spotlight fades away uh, so you could kind of see, show him doing sort of snippets of things. Maybe that what someone could do but I'm going to just focus on this bit at the end which is seems like the longest bit and the most interesting because he's facing or well, it's facing the camera um okay so trim comp to work area and I will add a key light And then just bring in that, that just a little bit, okay. And so I looked at this and thought, how am I going to get him into the scene in the most kind of dynamic, effective way possible, whether that was just going to be a fade up or kind of like I said before with a, a spotlight or something. But I noticed that he does this interesting like jumping thing. Um, so I think we could probably keyframe his position and have him like have the layer move up and it'll be like he's jumping into the scene. And I think that might work with the animation that's here. So I just want to mark here is when he first starts jumping. Um, so I'm going to add a little marker that will help me when I nest this comp in my um, main Stranger Things comp. But I don't want to put the marker on the layer itself. I actually want to put it on the comp. Um, so in order to do that, I need to, need to make sure that I don't have any layers selected. So if I had that selected, just click off it, make sure it's not selected. Click asterisk or hit asterisk on, on my keyboard. And I've added a marker to the actual comp, not the layer. So now if back in my Stranger Things comp, if I grab the Demogorgon, I can see this marker so that I know when he starts to jump and that will help inform where I put uh, my keyframes. But before I deal with him, um, I'm just going to jump onto something else, not to tease you, but we'll see here, we'll see the Demogorgon again in a minute. For this bit, I am going to, so you know the the opening titles for Stranger Things, it's like the glowing text that says Stranger Things and it's like it scales down into, into, into frame, like kind of iconic. I thought that would be a good opportunity for us to kind of copy a little bit of that and um, it will give us, it will expose you to using text, um, animating the scale parameter, property. Um, so I thought it'd be a good learning thing uh, to do. So what we can do to add text is we go up here and use the uh, text tool. And on my house, it might be different for yours, but like this is my main hero section surface. Like there, there's just um, kind of blank walls between the windows and um, it's just the best place for me to put text. So I'm just going to drag out a, um, a text box. And I'm going to come over here to character because this is um, where we sort of set the font and the size and everything of the of the text. So I will start typing. I've got caps locks on. Happy Halloween. And I mean, I was already practicing uh, what I was going to do for this tutorial. So it's already all set up, which is um, a shame, but let's unpick how I how I did this. So first of all, I'm using 
this font, which I found um, online, Ben Guyat Bold. Um, so I just installed that and I can add it uh, in here from this drop down if you find it and, and use it. Um, I'm using Bold as well. Actually, there is only Bold. You can control the size by dragging on this thing here. So if I make this down, turn this down, I can fit Happy Halloween in. Maybe reduce the um, space between the lines, just get this a little bit more um, together like that. When you first make, make text, you might find that it's filled and it has no stroke. So maybe it looks like that. Maybe it's filled with, oh, sorry. Maybe it's filled with, with black. So what you would do is with the text all selected, you want to turn the fill off. So you click this um, tiny swatch here, no fill color with the line through it to turn off the fill. And if you click this swatch behind, oh, sorry. So this is the main fill. And then this one behind is the um, stroke, which is another way of saying like the outline. And if you click on the color, you could set it to whatever you want. I am gonna set mine to white and I can do that just because they have black and white ready-made here for us. So white, I have a white stroke. And yours might be set to zero when you first do it. So you're wondering like, oh, hey, where, where's, my, where's my stroke? Well, you can add the thickness here. So five, uh, maybe four. Uh, so now we have, outlined um, Stranger Things type text. And if you remember from those credits, there's like a real glow on them. They look really sort of hot and um, yeah, like pulsing. So there is a inbuilt glow effect um, here, glow. I have caps locks, locks, caps lock on. So that's why that is happening, turn that off. So it's put a glow on. I think I will first do a nice like close glow. Um, so I'm gonna ramp up the glow intensity as much as possible. So this glow is quite kind of tight around the outline. But if I duplicate this um, effect, it will kind of layer on top. And this one, I'm going to increase the radius so it's kind of like a, an outer glow a wider, broader glow, more like it's emitting light or, or something. Uh, good. And the reason I started with white um, is because this is kind of the, the most bold we could make it. And I do like it in white, I, just because it's just so impactful and, and just very visible. But um, I might just go with um, a red because that just is the iconic color. Uh, but we have lost some contrast, so, or not contrast, like the way, the way it stands out and being able to, for it to be legible against the facade. So what I am gonna do about that is, first I'm gonna add a drop shadow, because why not, it's lovely. Just to get it to stand out make the size quite small and have it in the bottom right pretty close like that and then I'm going to add another layer style so I'm right clicking on the layer layer style um bevel and emboss I, so Bevel and Emboss adds a bit of shadow and a bit of highlight. I'm not actually interested in the shadow aspect, so I'm gonna turn the shadow opacity to zero. I really just want this um, nice white highlight. It's an inner bevel, it's set to smooth. Um, opacity up to 100, and the size, I really want it actually quite crisp. Or do I? Okay, five looks pretty good. Just check that angle so it's kind of top left. So that stands out 
quite a lot more. So that's without, with, without the drop shadow, with the drop shadow. Cool. Now I'm going to do the scale animation. So what I want to do first of all is move this anchor point to um, some area like a, a kind of gap within the text so that when we scale out um, it'll just make it easier to have the text disappear off the edges of the frame. So the way I move this anchor point is using this pan behind tool. So I can grab the anchor point. I'm going to put it in this gap here. And um, now I want to swivel open the layers properties. It's transform and go to scale. So I'm setting a keyframe so that just so that when I've changed it, it's going to automatically record any new scale value that I'm about about to give it. So I'm going to increase this until the text is entirely off the frame. Out of frame. Keep going, nearly there. Ah, okay. Good, so that keyframe is recorded there and I think I want it to be complete by around 200 frames. So then we bring it back to zero, excuse me, 100, 100%. And now it's coming in. One thing I want to do is if I select this keyframe and I hit F9, this is basically easing the keyframe. So it means that um, the rate at which it's scaling will slow down towards the end of the animation. So it gently eases it into its final its final value. Uh, it's just a little bit gentler rather than being like it'll be sort of it'll come to rest. Um, so that's quite um, a nice thing that you can do to your an animated keyframes as well. So F9 for um, easy, easy ease. Great. So that looks good. And so now back to the Demogorgon, I was thinking that I would like him to jump up just as this text is coming into position. So here he is and it's in front of the text. And I marked uh, here as where the jump starts. So um, let's scale him up first, shall we? Oh no, does it want to be bigger? Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit. And I'd like it to be here. So around here, when his feet touch the ground, let's expose the position and keyframe. And I already marked, so this marker came through from the um, Demogorgon, Demogorgon comp. So at this point, he is down here off frame. And if we go between these two things, he kind of leaps. So the other thing about the work area is if you drag the beginning, you can change the start point of your preview. So if I, before, if I'd click preview, it will start previewing from the, from the first frame. But if I change the work area, now it'll preview like from the beginning of that and it's just a little bit quicker rather than having to sit through um, a lot of animation that you're not interested in. So I can definitely trim off the front there so that I don't see the Demogorgon off the frame before he's jumping. Yeah, that's not too bad. So that's finishing. So if we bring it forward, he's starting to jump here. And 
Nice. He is could do with a little bit more red, I think, to tie him into this color world. So I'm going to use a curves and look at just the red channel and just pull it up a little bit. So you can see the effect of that is just to introduce a bit more red. Like some of this light is glowing and, and falling on it. And then, of course, we're going to need a drop shadow. It's only, it's only natural. So a distance fairly far away, definitely want it to be up, I think. And like I said before, I think a bit more opacity goes a long way with the drop shadow. So I think I'll leave it actually quite high. Make this change its color. And, and the Demogorgon already has um, an audio track, making some quite interesting sounds that accompany the, the roar. So nothing to do on the sound front with this one. So I think that is also complete. Okay, nice. So I'm going to save my project. And now I believe I have all my facades done. And now the next thing to do, um, we're getting there, nearly done, is to put them all now in like a master composition, which is my show. And I'm going to put some music on with it. So what I will do is create a new comp. So rather than drag anything on top of this icon like we've done in the past, I'm just going to simply click it to make a new composition. And I'll call this Halloween. Halloween show 2024, living in the past. The resolution is 1920 by 1080. That's very important. 25 frames a second. And this will be... 4,000 frames long. And all my facades belong in here. So I'm going to select them all and drag them in. This is good. Uh, but they're all stacked one on top of the other. I would like to sequence them. And After Effects can make this quite quick. Um, the one thing that I want to pay attention to before I click the magic button is just to make sure that I'm happy with the order in which these are, these layers are, because it's going to sequence them, starting with this as the first one, second, third, fourth, and so on. So um, just so that there's less faffing around later, if say like I know that I wanted the pumpkin one first, and like, I definitely want Stranger Things last, maybe like I wasn't happy with that, that goes towards the end, whatever. Okay, so just make sure you're happy with the order. And then I'm going to select all of the layers and right click and go to Keyframe Assistant, Sequence Layers. Do I want to overlap? Yes, please, I would. And I would like an overlap of one second, so 25 frames. 
Transition is currently off, but I would like you to automatically make a transition. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, let's cross dissolve front and back layers. So that's just going to be a gentle kind of fade, cross fade between each facade that takes a second to happen. Click OK. And here we have it. They've been sequenced and they cross fade one into the other. Good, and I don't need this um, extra, these extra frames. I'm just going to trim the end, go to trim comp to work area. Lovely. Um, and I did say that we were going to talk about an efficient way to do all this masking uh, on all of these at once, or like an, uh, an efficient way of doing it. And you might be already jumping the gun and thinking, oh, you're going to apply it now in this comp. Well, yes, I am. And so I can get all of these at once. Um, and I can use some of my ready-made masks um, to help me with that. So I can borrow them from, so it's just mask one and two, I won't make that mistake again. These were our cut out um, like arches and stuff, which are only relevant to this comp. So mask one and two and the ones I want. So just copy, control C, and then go back to my show, create a new solid, and I'll call this black areas. Okay, and so it's um, it's also 1920 by 1080, and that's what actually makes this next step possible is because we've borrowed masks from a 1920 by 1080 um, facade, and I'm pasting them onto a solid, which is the same resolution because it's adopted it from the comp. Um, it means that I can just simply paste those masks on but now rather than say we're, because um, these masks are saying we're interested in what's inside the green mask, mask one, but because we've got a black solid, actually we want to subtract from that. And to make our like side feather mask work, this mask now needs to be add. And now, because this layer sits above all of our facades, they're all going to inherit those, um, not masks, but they're going to be blacked out in the same uh, places. So it, it acts, it operates kind of like a mask, but saves us some of that uh, manual effort. Cool. So I said I wanted some music, which I do. Um, and it's this. Just a kind of spooky, ambient, quite chill um, bit of music. I'm not not going for the, um, you know, like kind of Halloween bop um, type thing. This is a lot more chill and um, kind of simpler. Um, so I've just dragged that in and I've got all the audio enabled for the for these layers so if they have um, sounds in them like the spiders they had that scuttling sound that's all going to come through and now will be the time to kind of test how those are sounding together you know like are any of these sound effects in here kind of like interfering too much with the music or is is the balance about right so I'm just going to give it a little listen yeah I think they're actually about right um I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with that so that's the show, I think. Um, we we have music, we have sound effects, we have masks, we've added lightning, rain, smoke, well not smoke, fire, ghosts, we've we've done a lot. We've used green screen footage, we've used footage with black backgrounds, um, you've done some keyframing. We've scaled things, we've positioned things, um, we've covered a lot of ground, and um, if you have got this far, well done. Um, 
I hope you um, have been able to follow and you feel a sense of um, accompany, uh, accomplishment. Um, please give it a like, in fact, if you get this far, because um, that would be awesome. It's been, um, yeah, like quite, it's taken me a while to, to record this. And um, I know I'm not like the most, um, I'm not the best at explaining things. Uh, I find this quite tricky doing this, actually. Uh, so, but I wanted to just set you up for success. If you've made some nice facades in Luma map, for example, and now you're like, what's next? Well, I think this is an achievable next step for a beginner. And But if you made this show, I think you could be, you could be proud of yourself. So um, yeah, I hope you found it valuable. Please let me know how you got on. If you ran into any problems in the comments, yeah, let me know. Please leave a like, subscribe. Um, yeah, I hope this was helpful.